We're talking today with Mike Bacon of Kentwood, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Mike, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, you know, where and when were you born? Oh, I was uh, born in 1942 in Newark, Ohio. Okay. Um, Did you grow up there or move around? I grew up there until I was 13, I think, and then we moved to uh, Darien, Connecticut. Uh, my dad was transferred to New York, so that was a whole new experience, and I went to high school there and some college. Okay, and what kind of job did your father have? Uh, he worked for Owens Corning Fiberglass. Um, initially, uh, he was hired, I, I just read this <laughs> last night to bone up on this. Uh, he was hired as a director of research and development, so he was running their lab mm -hmm. and uh, working with reinforced plastics, which turned out to be a, a big learning experience for the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so he went to New York and he stayed there until, uh, I guess, in the 60s, he came okay. back to Ohio. All right, uh, and, and so when did you finish high school? Finished high school in 1960. Okay, and what did you do after that? I went to college uh, a, a year at uh, University of Connecticut where I was in ROTC, and then uh, transferred to the University of uh, Bridgeport for a couple of years, and then from there went to the University of Dubuque in Iowa uh, where I graduated. Okay, and why were you bouncing around like that? Well, I flunked out of UConn. Well, that would do it. <laughs> the second semester, and then uh, uh, when I left, <laughs> Bridgeport, typical young guy, you know, you, you know everything. Uh, I, they had a, uh, I was living at home and uh, working, actually I was living in with two other guys. We all worked at the YMCA in Westport, Connecticut. And uh, Bridgeport came up with a policy of uh, anybody who was 25 and under and single had to move into a dorm. Well, I didn't want to do that. And uh, they also, uh, well, I, I went to appeal to the uh, authorities there. Mm -hmm. And as I was sitting in my car waiting to go in for my appointment, I saw the guy that I was supposed to be interviewing with run out the back door with his bag of golf clubs. And I got upset. And then I, uh, I had spent a lot of time working on an essay in the English class too and came back with a D. Mm -hmm. And I got really mad and I said, that's it. And I walked out and I said, I'm not going back there. Okay, so how did you come up with Dubuque? Uh, well, in the meantime, my brother and a couple of his friends graduated from high school and, and they went out to Dubuque to play football and mm -hmm. to go to school. And uh, the um, vice president of the college came by and was on a goodwill tour through New England. At that time, as I understand it, about 80% of the students enrolled in colleges and universities in the United States came from within an 80 mile radius of New York City. Wow. And so it was important for them, I think, to cultivate that market. But anyway, came out, had dinner with my uh, mom and dad, and uh, so they invited me down, and I had dinner with them, and we talked. And you know, I, he, he was really good. And uh, the next day I was in my car, packed up and driving out to Iowa, and uh, that was the right place for me, and I was able to finish and met my wife there. We got married, and... Uh, and what did you major in in the end? In the end, <laughs> English. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then, so when did you graduate? Uh, 1965. Okay. And what did you do after you got out? Then I worked as an admissions counselor for the university for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, as my wife was finishing her degree there, <clears throat> too, and... Um, that was when I got the letter from the draft board saying that I had no more exemptions mm -hmm. and I was going to be drafted. So that's when I decided to enlist to get OCS. Okay. So, you, so officer candidate school. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when then does that process start? When do you start training? Well, um, in uh, I think it was April of 1966, we mm -hmm. saw that I enlisted and uh, I went to... Uh, basic training in Fort Dix not too long after that and uh, then I w from there I went to AIT at Fort McClellan, Alabama and that took up about 20 weeks with right. the leave and everything in there. Okay, so describe uh, basic training. It's Fort Dix, that's in New Jersey. Yeah, all right. Yes. Uh, so what was basic training like for you? Uh, it 
was uh, not too bad uh, because I'd had ROTC. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a squad commander or a squad leader. When, mm -hmm. <coughs> pardon me, whatever you call it. And uh, had to learn a lot of discipline and you get, but everybody else was too, and it felt good mm -hmm. uh, to be with a group of people who were challenged and uh, were learning how to drill <laughs> and drill and drill and push ups and sit ups and drill. <laughs> and uh, we, we got pretty good at it. Okay. So, what was the attitude of the other guys that you were training with? I mean, did they rather be someplace else or? Were they, did they push back against the instructors? No, uh, I didn't experience that and okay. I don't remember them. There were three or four guys in our platoon who uh, had been uh, firefighters out west and I think they called them smoke jumpers or something mm -hmm. like that and, and they were in the group uh, and so we learned a little bit from them too and uh, they were role models that we followed. Okay. Now at this point, had you paid much attention to what was going on in Vietnam or anything like that? I, I knew what was going on in Vietnam. Um, my wife had two brothers and they both served over there. Um, and uh, it was kind of interesting too. When I was at the University of Bridgeport, uh, the uh, incident with Cuba occurred. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, we were all in the TV room uh, by the student union watching that play out and I, I wondered about a friend of mine who was in the 82nd Airborne and I talked to him a little bit later and he said yeah he was in a plane over Cuba mm -hmm. during that incident and uh, they didn't have to drop they came back but to that degree I was aware of things going on and then everybody trying to get to Canada and get away from the draft and and that uh, but otherwise not no okay. all right uh, so, uh, now, the time you enlisted basically was the plan to go through the training and then move on to officer candidate school in sequence. Was that set up already? Yes. Okay, and you were college graduates, so you were natural yes. material for that to begin yes. with. Okay, uh, so then you do your basic and, and then, okay, then the AIT. And what were you, was that just infantry AIT or was that something else? Yes, it was infantry AIT, but it was, uh, as I found out later, uh, it was designed to accommodate those that were going into OCS mm -hmm. in the different branches. So it was, um, but I think it was standard uh, infantry AIT. Um, we did the gas chamber, we did practicing throwing grenades, uh, rifles, uh, all of that. Um, okay, and did you do training in the field and camping out overnight and that kind of thing? Uh, I know we went to a couple of places where they had some tents set up for us, but I don't remember most, I think most every night we were in the barracks mm -hmm. because the next morning some of the guys that were able to sneak out would come back in and then we'd go off to breakfast and then do our daily routine. And I don't remember a lot of it, which is a surprise. Uh, AIT is mostly a blur for me. Okay. Uh, do you have a sense that in certain ways it was less intense than, than basic in terms of just the discipline and things? Yes. Okay. Oh, quite a, quite a bit different. All right. Uh, and at that point, what kinds of, do you remember what kinds of people were instructing you? Were these people who had, you know, anyone been to Vietnam yet or anything like that? Uh, I remember the, uh, the sergeant in the uh, grenade tossing thing mm -hmm. was uh, an E6 and had been to Vietnam and definitely had seen a lot <laughs> and um, everybody else had been uh, you don't they, they don't tell you where their experience mm -hmm. is from they just tell you drop down and give me 15 or whatever um, in OCS the, the guys were graduates of the OCS school themselves I think and had some further training uh, I don't remember anybody else saying anything. Okay, so when did you then finish up with AIT? Okay, that had to be um, in 60, 
Well, if I went still 66, if you went in in April. Yeah, it was probably uh, late summer, early fall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then, so you move in into officer candidate school next. And where did right. where did they do that? That was at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Okay. And now describe what that program was like. Well, that was a, a rigorous program of um, a lot of physical exercise, a lot of classroom work, um, and some harassment. Uh, I remember we did a Chinese fire drill one time, uh, which was interesting, we, and we got it done. Um, For people who don't know what that is, can you explain that? Yes, uh, you had to, uh, you were alerted that it was happening, so you had to uh, grab your foot locker and run down, we were in the second floor of the barracks, we had to run down, line up, put your foot locker uh, on the ground, flip it open, and then they would come by and inspect and make sure everything was located where it was supposed to be, underwear was rolled up and all of that. And uh, they, they'd do other things too to rattle you. And then you had to close it, grab it, pick it up, run upstairs, put it back where it was supposed to be and, and all of that. Um, so that was a, a, a nice variety. And then we had a, a couple of other uh, things. We had uh, two rows of uh, bunks and then two rows of foot lockers and then a center aisle that nobody ever walked on because that, that was kept polished and shining except the night that they caught us uh, getting pizza delivered uh, to the back door. And so the TAC officers came in and took the pizza and smashed it on the floor poured all the pop and the soda that was brought into on the floor. And then we had to low crawl uh, the length of the barracks, down the stairs, come back up, low crawl back to our locations. And then I think they gave us uh, seven minutes to clean up. And so everybody cleaned up and uh, got the polisher out, polished the floor, so that at the end of that brief amount of time, it looked just like it did before they caught us. <laughs> if you couldn't walk in the center aisle, was there another way to get around the cots or did you just Be climb over them? Between the foot lockers and the bunks, mm -hmm. there was a, a walkway, Okay, maybe about three feet wide. All right. Uh, now, was this sort of a standard infantry AIT that you were doing or uh, was it just something general that was mostly just about being an officer? Oh, uh, you mentioned AIT, but you meant OCS. OCS, yeah. 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 Uh, it was, uh, the classroom work was specifically geared towards communications, communications okay. equipment, and things like that. But also, um, I'm sure we got a lot of other things. It just seems to be that uh, we just wanted to survive and get through each day. And I don't remember the details of some of the classes we were in. Okay. Well, you're telling me, though, that you know, it was communications work. So pretty much all the guys there were going to head toward a specialization in communications. And at that right. point, the Army is expanding so much that they would be able to have a whole class full of people doing exactly that. Well, yes, and, and we had classes that came in every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, my class was 11-67. Uh, we've got an association of uh, Signal Corps officers. Uh, and when I go back and read through that, uh, the number of people who went through the program is astounding. And then if you multiply that by all the different services yep. and branches and classes and MOSs, there are a lot of people just constantly flowing through the system. Right. Okay. So how long did the OCS last? Six months. Okay. Uh, now during that time, now you're in OCS, do you get to go off base and do other things? <laughs> no. No. Uh, during OCS, you're there. Okay. Um, now, my wife uh, came down to uh, Fort Gordon and was able to get a, a job, mm -hmm. and she and another one of the candidate's wives roomed together. So, um, didn't even get to see her uh, because we were focused right on our training. But we were able to communicate. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wives sometimes would make up 
a big bag of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and uh, drive by the, the fence that surrounded where we were and they'd throw the bag over the fence and somebody would run out and grab it and we'd get a little extra food sometimes and that's the only contact uh, we had there. Um, my brother came down to visit and I was able to walk over to the side and stand at parade rest and talk to him for maybe five minutes uh, but that was that was it. Okay, that sounds kind of extreme. I'm not sure anyone has, has told that particular story before, but I know that OCS was pretty intense in most places you were, yes. or bending anywhere else. So, yeah. okay. all right. So you survive all of that, right? Uh, and now what happens to you? Well, then I'm assigned to uh, go to Germany. So, I think I had a, a brief period of uh, a leave. So my wife and I drove back to uh, Toledo, where my folks lived at the time, and <laughs> also as a young person, you're always trying to do some neat things. So uh, we turned in our Volkswagen and bought a '67 che Chevrolet Camaro uh, with, you know, white with a black bumblebee stripe to take with us to Germany. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So as an officer, you can have your wife come out with you. Yes. All right. Uh, and then, so, so then um, I drove the car to uh, Dover where I, it was put on a boat and I reported uh, in. Uh, during that time, um, to answer one of your former questions, uh, the Six Day War was going on. So I was listening to the results of that on the radio as I drove out there. Uh, then I flew to uh, Frankfurt um, I was picked up by a Jeep uh, and a driver and uh, driven south to Mannheim where the 97th Signal Battalion was uh, headquartered. And uh, they told me that they almost didn't come to get me because they were coming out of the field where they had set up uh, because of this Six Day War. And uh, the 97th Signal Battalion is a tactical signal battalion. Um, I think there are only, there, at that time, there were only two tacticals. One was in Germany and one was in Korea. I think that's right. Okay. And um, so they were coming out of the field. And anyway, I got there and they gave me a room. And I reported in and uh, just started okay. learning things. So what does a tactical signal battalion do? Well, uh, 97th Signal Battalion was part of 7th Army Comm Command, and that was part of 7th Army. Um, if a war were to break out, then one of the companies, well, we had three units. Uh, at Tompkins Barracks, we had a, a setup called Main Lead, and there we had all of the communications equipment plus a secure communications room. Uh, <laughs> it was really secure. And if a war broke out, then main lead would become the uh, communications center for the, the battle operations for three days. And that gave uh, another, one of the companies time to set up Army Main, which was a, a big place where the commanders could then have communications with all the peripheral uh, units. And another company would sign up set up main rear. So then they always did it as if we were going to be retreating. So um, if, if the battle got too close, then Army Main would drop back to Army Rear and Army Main would leapfrog back and, and create a new Army Rear. Mm -hmm. And so they'd always have some kind of a communication structure set up uh, during a battle. And I think that's the difference between that and STRATCOM, which was the stationary communications set up in buildings, and, and they never went to the field, as far as I know. Okay. So as you get there, what kind of duties do you have? Well, first of all, I'm uh, assigned as a platoon leader, and my platoon man's main lead, and it was a three-day, three-night, three-days-off uh, shift rotation, 12 hours per shift, and our group would go out and, and occupy and, and run the main lead 
uh, facilities at Tompkins Barracks just outside Heidelberg. And then um, after that, I, I did that for a few months. Then I went to another company and I was a wire platoon leader. And its main job was to string cable among all the different facilities. And um, I did that for a few months. And then just before I left, I became headquarters company commander. And uh, that was an interesting experience too because we did a, an inventory. It had to sign over or sign off on the TO&E, the table of operations and, and equipment. Uh, the, the supply list that you're assigned. <laughs> and the, uh, the story was that sometime, uh, I think it was General Patton started this and he would send these things out to, to have them signed by the commanders of the different u units and they'd never check anything, they'd just sign it and send it back. So occasionally he'd put a tank on there and they'd sign off and so he'd send them a tank to teach them a lesson <laughs> and I'd heard that story so I said I'm not going to be responsible for a tank <laughs> and uh, I had everybody double check everything and and they signed off on their own the motor pool signed off and and everybody else the photo platoon signed off and all of that and uh, I didn't have to do that really all I had to do was just make sure that the list didn't have a tank on it but right. It was fun. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and then your wife came over. So Yes, you, my you, wife was there. Do you live on base, off base? What do you do? We got an apartment off base in uh, Viernheim. And um, uh, she lived there. Our first child was born there in the Heidelberg Hospital. Uh, a couple of other people lived in the building, too. Uh, that I uh, served with. Uh, one guy was interesting because he was um, diagnosed with a hernia and was going to have to have surgery, uh, but he just bought a Porsche 911. And uh, he came to me and he said, uh, would you do me a favor? And I said, yes. He said, my Porsche needs to be driven every day. And uh, after my surgery, I'm not going to be able to drive it. So. <laughs> I got to drive his Porsche for about three weeks until he recovered and was able uh, to do that. And a couple of other people uh, lived in the building too. Um, the, the person who managed the, the it was a, a, a high rise apartment building. Uh, the person who managed it was a, of course a German national. And he was expecting, I think, uh, tips from everybody. <laughs> and it didn't necessarily get them, and that was an interesting experience. And what, um, how did the Germans seem to view the American servicemen? Um, I, I didn't uh, encounter any problems. Uh, what I did encounter was that if I wanted to practice my German, I couldn't because they wanted to practice English. Mm -hmm. They had to take English <coughs> as a second language. And m most of them wanted to practice mm -hmm. it as much as they possibly could. So the furthest I could get with German was how to order beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Either one or two, ein beer, or zwei beer, or drei beer. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and did any of them ever talk about World War II or anything like that, or did they just stay away from that? I stayed away from it. Um, but on one occasion, one, one of the other officers came over from uh, Tom Poe was the, I was supposed to be his sponsor when he came over. So we spent some time with him and he, um, he met a girl over there and they uh, got married. So the celebration at the guest house afterwards was uh, a really nice thing and they brought out several different courses and, and a different wine between each course. And across the table from us was a World War II uh, vet who couldn't speak English. And we couldn't speak uh, German. Mm -hmm. My wife could a little bit, but I couldn't. But after about the third course, it didn't matter. And we got along just great. Uh, 
we communicated a lot of stuff. I have no idea what it was, but I remember we were laughing and enjoying and, and just having a good time. And that seemed to be the, the trend. If, mm -hmm. if anything happened, that was what the relationship would be like. Okay. Uh, now, do you have an idea of, out of your OCS group, because you were all signal guys, what proportion of them went to Vietnam and what proportion went elsewhere? Do you know what, where other guys got orders for? Um, my class was uh, primarily sent to Germany. Um, but then after a, a year, uh, some guys who were single were then sent to Germany. But since I was married, I think, uh, I was not sent to, to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. The class before me went to Vietnam, the class after went to Vietnam, and that's all I'm aware of specifically. All right. Uh, now, if you think about, so how long did you spend in Germany? Was that a full year? Uh, uh, just under two years. Oh, two years, okay. Yeah. Now, are there particular events or memories that kind of stand out for you uh, from that time? Yes. Um, one was uh, the big exercise reforger. And uh, the idea was, uh, I think, that they established, they kept the superstructure, or the uh, infrastructure of the uh, army and its different units in Germany, but a lot of the personnel were still in the States. And so they would have this exercise of bringing all the servicemen back over, and then they'd revitalize the equipment and the facilities and get ready for a, a war. And that was a, a big deal. Uh, and I remember on another occasion, we went out to uh, the field and we had to travel a distance to get there. I'm not sure where we went, but I do remember that we were very much aware of this big long black car following us that had a red flag on the front fender and it was uh, from the Russian embassy and they were keeping very close tabs on us. And so that seemed to be kind of important. And w another time too, just before I left, well, it was in uh, late 68, I think it was, uh, the, the uh, Warsaw Pact forces invaded Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of an exciting time too, because the rumor was that they yelled out at the soldiers, where do you think you are? And they said, this is Germany, isn't it? We kind of got a little spook there. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and daughter at that time were on alert and ready to, to be put on a plane to, to come back to the States. But then that quieted down mm -hmm. um, and that didn't happen. But I remember those. All right. And then some other good times too. Now, do you have a sense of what uh, morale was like among the American troops in Germany at that point? or at least the ones in your unit? Morale was pretty good. Um, but there was this story going around about uh, Vietnam vets uh, coming back and not being happy. And maybe it wasn't just Vietnam vets. Maybe it was just anybody who wasn't happy. But the uh, technique that they used, and I, I can't verify this, but it's just a story, but they would a lot of the uh, the barracks were two stories and the company commander would be in the front office in the front of the building and what these guys would do if they didn't like them would go upstairs and put a grenade on a piece of rope pull the pin and swing the rope out let the grenade come in the window and boom what a story that makes but I never heard of it happening well I, I did hear that that had happened once or twice but yeah. everybody else seemed to have a good time. And then I remember they, um, the battalion commander decided to put uh, a beer hall in the basement of the barracks. And the, the troops were real excited about that because they get fresh beer. And, but it was American beer and it was iced, mm -hmm. which is different from German beer, which is drunk at warm at room temperature. Okay. So, well, I suppose the business with, with the grenades, I mean, that, that's fragging officers fragging, and stuff. Yeah. And, and you have a lot of stories of that out of Vietnam, and most of them probably aren't true. So it's yeah. like, it makes a great story. And I do get stories where that happens periodically, but it does, does get your attention. And a lot of things were done where they couldn't quite go to the, as far as blowing something up. 
but they were sending messages yeah. to these people that they had to clean up or, or leave or something. Yeah. yeah. The, and it was a story. It was mm -hmm. kind of obviously a story, but I, there was a, one, um, one guy that came from Vietnam, I remember, and he was just... Uh, uh, he was different in that he was more experienced, uh, more sarcastic. Uh, he wore a camouflage thing on top of his helmet and uh, had a, an elastic band around it and I think maybe a, a card in there. And, and his attitude was a little bit like, uh, you know, Germany's nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, you should, you should have been in Vietnam if you want to see what the Army's like. <laughs> That was the only incident I, I recall about that. Yeah. Now, did you notice the army ever kind of taking drafts of men out of Vietnam, out, out of Germany, and sending them to Vietnam, or uh, did anyone who came to your unit just stay there for a full hitch? That's a good question. I, I really don't know if okay. I can answer that with any. Th All right. But it was not so. That's not something that that kind of sticks out. No, for most of them were there, and they stayed there, and then mm -hmm. finished their tour and went back home. Yeah. And I guess a lot of what your unit was actually doing is not something that they had a unit doing in the same way in Vietnam. And they probably had high-level communications there. But yeah, and, and and our our thing was changing. Mm -hmm. When I got there, we had a full complement of enlisted men and officers, warrant officers, and, and the rest. By the time I left. The numbers were way down, uh, and another transition, I'm sure, was in, in the making, because the signal corps doesn't exist anymore. Right. Yeah. And as it was, it may be that there are pe so people would rotate out or their stints would end, but they just don't get replaced? Yeah. 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 And to a certain extent, the other personnel might have been going to Vietnam, or it may just be yeah. part of the rest of the transition. Did you have any kind of computer equipment, or was it all still solid state? Yeah, no computers. That none that I can recall. Okay. I remember uh, we had to do a report every night from uh, main lead to send it up to Seventh Army Comp Command, and uh, we did it on a typewriter. And it would have been so much nicer if we'd had some kind of a computer, but it just did. You no, know, I I don't remember seeing anything in any of the facilities, but maybe in the secure areas, uh, they might have had some things, but I was never allowed to even, even though they're in my building in headquarters company, I can't go in there. Uh, I wasn't cleared for it. Okay. So while you were living there, uh, did you get to travel around Europe at all? We had one three-day pass, and we went to Garmisch, Partenkirchen. Mm -hmm and uh, spent a couple of days there with another couple and our kids. And um, then uh, one time I had a, well, there's three, day, three nights, three days, three days off. Mm -hmm. uh, during that three day off period, my wife and I drove over into uh, France and I think we went through Trier too and saw mm -hmm. uh, that. But that was pretty much it, All right. unfortunately. But, but even then, you get to see where you live, you know, mm -hmm. in the neighborhood and the local. Um, meet some, we met some Germans. We, we got to be friends with some, and it was nice uh, mm -hmm. that way, but no other traveling. All right. So when does your stint in Germany finish up? In 1969. Okay. And do you get discharged when you come back, or what yes. happens? Okay. Uh, I flew back to, um, in, came into Dover, and then was discharged, I think, at Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. uh, I um, came in at night, and it was, yes, sir, how are you, sir? And next morning it was, uh, goodbye, Mr. Bacon. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, had they made any effort to encourage you to re-enlist, or were they already downsizing by then? Uh, I think I was told that I could re-enlist. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there wasn't a, a big effort. It was downsizing, I think. Right, okay. Uh, I think it was probably the infantry officers they maybe still needed the most of at that point yeah. uh, as well. Okay, so you're out. Now, what do you do after you're out? Oh, after I was out, uh, I got a job with, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got to reorient my thinking here. 
I got a job with Owens, Illinois, uh, selling uh, prescription containers. Uh, so, and I went, to, uh, we were sent to Memphis and I worked uh, Tennessee and parts of uh, Kentucky and that area uh, for a year. And then I, I qualified to join the general line class. So I went back to Toledo, Ohio and um, went through that class. And then I was uh, sent to uh, Baltimore and I worked there for a while. And then I went up to Rochester, New York and worked there for a while and sold glass containers to beverage, food manufacturers. And, um, then I left them and went with Pfizer Diagnostics for a year and that brought me to Michigan. And then I did that for a year and then I left them, took advantage of what was left of the GI Bill and then got a graduate degree and a teaching certificate and then uh, started teaching English at uh, East Kentwood High School here. Right. and retired from there. All right, uh, so before we uh, close this out, um, I guess, has anything else popped into your head about particularly the time in Germany that you haven't brought into the story yet? Um, oh, uh, we did have a chance to visit Rotenburg. Uh, and if you've ever been there, that's an interesting place. It was one of the towns that had not been damaged during World War II. So you got to see the, what it looked like <laughs> from its beginning. And that was uh, really nice. And we just enjoyed being there. We enjoyed the food. We enjoyed the, the camaraderie. We enjoyed all the people we met. Uh, looking back, it was a learning experience, but at the time it just seemed it went by in a blur. Well, that, uh, so, so as you do look back now, um, how do you think your time in the service affected you or what did you take out of it? Well, first of all, I found that I could do it, which when I was going to be drafted, I thought there's no way I can go into the Army because I don't want to pick up a gun and shoot somebody. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've got that in me. Um, but I didn't know anything else that was uh, attached to it. And I, I said, I'm just going to do this, throw myself into it, and make the best and, and it worked out. It, so I think it opened my eyes, gave me some confidence, uh, a lot of experiences, uh, uh, things that my wife and I have shared that, that have been important to us over time and, um, and it gave me the idea that, well, like the other guy that uh, you interviewed last week, he said, when I finished it, I figured if I could do that, I can do anything, and I think I came away with that. Yeah. All right, then. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to share the story today. Well, thank you very much for doing this. <laughs>